Hi there, my name is Peter Mumby. I'm a coral reef ecologist at the University of Queensland. And today we're going to be talking about marine ecosystem services. And these are the services that natural ecosystems provide to humans for free. We're going to take a look now at a variety of different types of ecosystem service. We're going to start with provisioning services. And a very obvious one is the ability of mangroves to provide wood and that wood might be used as a source of fuel or it might be used for building houses for example. If we move on to coral reefs we're familiar with the numbers of fish that you find on a reef and of course this provides a provisioning service of food in terms of reef fish and a source of protein. Another very important provisioning service is pharmaceutical products and many tropical organisms have a huge number of bacteria associated with them, particularly some of the invertebrates and algae. And as an example, there's actually a Caribbean sea squirt that's had a very strong reaction against some cancer agents. And in fact, chemicals that were then developed and then developed as drugs from these sea squirts have been synthesized and are now used in the treatment of ovarian cancer. Another category of service are regulating services. And these are services that essentially regulate the environment that we experience and, of course, providing us some benefit. Now, looking at an example of a coral reef, we know that when you have large waves coming into the coast, maybe because there's a storm out in the ocean, that when those waves break upon the reef, much of that wave energy is dissipated by the reef itself and the wave passing over the reef reduces in size and strength. Now, that wave can then carry on moving into the lagoon, and as it does so, it might encounter mangroves. Mangroves and the mud that, that sits underneath them also serve as a regulating service in that they further attenuate the amount of energy that's being brought into the coast by this wave. Moving gears now to cultural services, one of my personal favourite services is the enjoyment you get from diving on a coral reef. And so that would be a service of tourism for a lot of people. Another cultural service might be kayaking through a mangrove. It's a fantastic way that sort of connect with nature. There's lots of birds, there'd be turtles in there, maybe even lucky and see a crocodile. But this is often a very important way in which people can keep their connection with nature fresh. And then lastly, there's more intangible cultural benefits, often what's known as a, a sense of place. And these are the sorts of benefits you accrue by having some kind of familiarity and sense of identity and, and sort of linkage with a healthy ecosystem. You know, that might be for some people seeing birds at the bottom of their garden. It might be people in a tropical seascape looking out from a sandy beach and seeing healthy turtles swimming by, lots of diverse reef fish swimming across a healthy reef. Those are the sorts of things that people benefit from, and sometimes they take them for granted. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment went through a fairly extensive categorization of ecosystem services. So if we look at how these map on to the three major habitats in tropical ecosystems, which are coral reefs, seagrasses, and mangroves, what we see again are the major services, which are provisioning services, which are food, such as fish, wood and fiber, which come from mangroves, regulating services such as uh, storm protection, and then finally these cultural services. Now the important thing is that these services actually deliver benefits to humans and they benefit our well-being overall. And so let's look at some examples. For example, the link between sort of food and fish and wood and fibre benefits in a number of ways. By providing wood, you're able to build houses, which is an essential thing as a basic material for a good life. Um, health is important. We know that eating fish is very important for our health. It provides uh, omega-3 and other sorts of essential minerals and nutrients. Security. Having a prolific supply of wood can actually provide some kind of energy security in certain sorts of environments. If we look at storm protection, we can think of a whole variety of benefits. Again, by shadowing areas of the coast from uh, incident wave energy, we're providing uh, good, secure housing. So we're getting benefit there for security and, and, and a well-being and a place to live. 
as well as potential benefits to health because if you prevent the amount of flooding that can occur after major storms then it's less likely that sewers will overflow and there'll be all sorts of, of health problems that can follow on from that. And if we look at the cultural services, well these are good for sort of maintaining good social relations and often good for our mental well-being. Being able to connect with green spaces is often very good for our overall quality of life. Sometimes I ask, why should we value ecosystem services? And there's many reasons for doing this, but one of them is that it helps hopefully prevent us making inappropriate environmental decisions. And I can give you a, an example from Cancun in Mexico. Now, Cancun is extremely important. Um, it's a beautiful place to visit on the northern tip of the Yucatan coast in the Caribbean. Um, so it's a, it's a real tourism mecca. However, this is a satellite image of the area around Cancun in 2005, shortly after it had been hit by a hurricane. And what this hurricane did is it removed vast amounts of sand from the beaches. One of the reasons for that is because most of the mangroves that might have been protecting that coastal fringe had been removed to make way for the resorts. And also the coral reefs a little way offshore are not, and aren't in the best of health. Now, if we look a bit further into the future, this is a more recent satellite image, you can see that the beaches around the coast are once again restored and looking beautiful. However, this cost $90 million. This was a very expensive human intervention to replace something that nature usually provides to us virtually for free. So if we look at what's actually happened here, we have uh, a mangrove removal for hotel development. That's the start. This then leads to uh, a change in the ability of a coastal area to provide natural uh, protection from storms. Once that happens, we see uh, a removal of sand and sediment and the need for humans to replace that themselves. So they go out onto the coast and they dredge the seabed for new sand that they can then dump back onto the coast to make the beaches once more. Unfortunately, the process of all that dredging can have damaging impacts all of its own. It leads to a lot of sediment entering into the water that can smother coral reefs and essentially cause coral mortality. If you kill the coral, then this then reduces the natural ability of the ecosystem to act as a coastal defense, maybe increasing the amount of erosion that happens on the coastal zone. So this becomes a kind of reinforcing cycle that's not to human advantage. So let's just summarize why we need to value ecosystem services. Well, first of all, it's really important that countries try and incorporate their natural capital in their national sets of accounts. Almost all countries keep account of their mineral wealth, of their oil and gas reserves, of their human cap capital, but very rarely do they actually value the ecosystem services that are often taken for granted. Things like the provision of clean drinking water when it's filtered through appropriate vegetation. And so by failing to do this, there's a real risk that we may not adequately monitor and take corrective action should there be a problem, should we start losing some of those ecosystem services. Now, another reason for doing it is to help the community understand how they benefit from ecosystems. Because as I said, I think often people just take things for granted and having greater communication and evaluation will help change people's perspective and perhaps lead to more environmentally friendly behavior. And then another aspect that should follow on from this is by more appropriately valuing our environment, it's more likely that we'll put the resources needed to maintain a good environment and make those available for use to try and keep this environment healthy for everybody's benefit. Now, if we want to break down the process of valuing services, then it's essentially a three-step process. And let's illustrate that with a car reef example. We start with the state of an ecosystem. And the state might just be the amount of living coral, the complexity of that reef. We know that corals have these sort of very uh, complex structures that provide lots of hiding places to support high levels of biodiversity. So you might measure its state by just going into the field, measuring how much coral is there, and so forth. That state supports a function, and it's that ecosystem function that we're often interested in. In this case, a function might be 
the provision of habitat to support lots of reef fish. So it's the ability of a reef to provide habitat, to have lots of fish available and surviving and undertaking predator-prey interactions as we talked about. And it's then that, that group of fish that provides a service because people then can come along and fish those and generate food and a livelihood. So it's state function service. Of course, what we're concerned about is that if you don't have such a good state, maybe in this case we have a reef that's been um, dynamited, that might provide much less habitat quality and therefore there'll be fewer fish living on that reef. And if there's fewer fish, the benefits to people are going to be lower. And to some extent, these things can be reinforcing. So if we do have a system of a healthy reef with prolific function that allows us to generate a good livelihood from that, if some of that resource is being reinvested into the uh, protection and maintenance of that habitat because we're valuing what it's providing for us, then it's more likely that we'll have this feedback of a high value allowing us to maintain that system in a, in a good state by preventing some of the stresses such as um, uh, sediment runoff, um, overfishing, and damaging fishing techniques from occurring. If, on the other hand, we don't even try to value that service, then it's more likely that people will take poorer decisions, which will lead to a sort of a degradation of that reef state, which we know ends up with us essentially having lower benefits at the end of the day. So it should be a sort of virtuous cycle where valuing something that's really important to us helps us maintain it. Okay. So, so far what we've really talked about then is the sort of ecological component and that's where biologists and ecologists often worked to forge this link between the state of a system and its function. And that includes a lot of ecology, it certainly includes things like predator-prey interactions that we've already talked about. And then the linking it to the services is how people benefit from that and that's the preserve of social scientists and economists. Okay. Now. What this means, of course, is that people have to work together and we have to have a new way of doing research often that allows for partnerships across very different disciplines. All right. So let's look at how ecologists make this link between the state and the function of a system. Now sometimes the valuation is relatively straightforward. In this example, if you're just wanting to value the contribution of mangrove as a supplier of wood, it's relatively straightforward. You can see the mangrove, you can measure the wood, that's very easy. But in many cases, we're talking about ecological processes that are much more difficult to understand. And if we think about things like the link between a coral reef and fish production, we would have to get into the details of recruitment of fish, predator-prey interactions, competition among fish, and so forth. So that's a much more complicated task. So let's just have a look at an example, and this one looking at the role of mangroves as a as a habitat for juvenile fish. Now, if you've ever had the benefit of swimming in a mangrove system, um, usually you can go snork snorkeling here amongst the prop roots, what you'll notice is a very high density of juvenile fish. And many of these fish actually live on coral reefs as adults. And so the question we might ask is, what is the functional value of these mangroves as a nursery habitat for reef fish which are then harvested by fishers? And that's not a very simple question to answer. Now, we did some work a number of years ago across Belize and Mexico to, to look at this question. And we chose this region because it has one very desirable characteristic. It has a whole series of offshore reef systems that are quite isolated from the rest of the environment. And some of these reefs have got very little mangrove. Sometimes that's natural, sometimes that's not. Either way, if we look at the numbers of adult fish on those reefs, we can be pretty sure that they must have grown up without the benefit of access to mangrove because they wouldn't have come from elsewhere in the seascape and then crossed open ocean that might be several miles deep to get to these reefs as adults. Equally, there are some reefs there that actually have very prolific mangroves. So we can undertake a comparison and say, well, with everything else being equal, as it is in this area, how much has that provision of mangroves led to a change in the numbers of fish out on the reef, the adult fish that is? And so what we find is that really only one species of fish has a very sort of strong, almost obligate dependency 
on there being mangrove, and that's Scara squacamea, the rainbow parrotfish. This is the largest herbivorous fish in the Atlantic. It measures up to about one meter in size. It's just a fabulous fish if you ever get the chance to see it. And what we find is that the juveniles are almost always associated with mangroves, and you find the most adults where mangroves are in reasonably close proximity. For most coral reef species that you find in mangroves as juveniles, you will still find them out on reefs whether there's mangroves or not. But if the mangrove is present, you find far more of them. And so if we look here at two types of grunt, this is the blue stripe grunt and the French grunt, we see that the number of adult fish on the reef can be many, many times greater where you have mangroves in the system. We see the same thing here with two commercially important species. This is the schoolmaster snapper and the yellowtail snapper. So what this is telling us then is that the provision of a healthy mangrove environment can lead to a very significant increase in the number of adult fish that people can harvest. So the mangrove is providing a function which is a nursery habitat to the coral reef fish and then that function is helping to sustain the service of a reef fishery.